Welcome back, this is part 2 of the Amiga 2000 EATX build. Last time we got the board assembled, fitted the Amiga 500 Plus chipset, sorted out a couple of minor problems and got it to boot. There still is a bit of work to do though. All the expansion slots, they still need to be fitted. And the one thing that I suppose makes it the Amiga 2000, that still needs to be fitted, that is the Buster chip. Now, I don't have an original Buster, but what I do have is this little PCB created by Liv2. This is the Bluster, a modern replacement for the old chip. So let's start by putting this together. I'm hopeful this won't be too stressful. We just have a CPLD to fit to the top side. And then on the bottom, there are six little capacitors and the voltage regulator. There's the CPLD, there's the capacitors, the regulator, well, um, that's in the post, but hopefully it will be here in the next day or two. It doesn't stop us getting the CPLD fitted and using our Raspberry Pi, we can get it programmed. Fitting the CPLD is going to be tricky enough actually, because the pins of it get really close to these holes through which we need to stick legs that will eventually go down into the socket on the motherboard. But let's just see how we get on. So one chip, pin one on the chip, as we know, there's a dot on that, corresponding dot on the PCB here. I need to mount this something like that. No time like the present. Just going to start with trying to get one pin down. I have pre tinned the iron, so just a matter of trying to position this. That doesn't look too bad there. And let me see if I can just get the one or even a couple of these pins stuck down. Okay, we have created the bridge there on those pins, but that's fine. We can sort that out. But I think our orientation is pretty good. Certainly not bad for me not using any magnification. After I do get it soldered down, I will go over the whole thing with magnification, just to be sure. But I'm pretty happy with the orientation of that, so let's see if we can get that whole opposite side down. Again, I'm just going to turn up the iron for this, so let's see how we get on. I think I need just a tiny wee bit more solder. And I think that's fine. Yes, I have blocked a couple of those holes there. Just given their proximity, I fully expected to do that. Maybe if I was thinking ahead, a bit of our high temperature masking tape over those holes would protect them, but it's no big deal. I can always flip the thing over and use the desoldering station to clear them again. So I've bridged quite a few of the pins there. Obviously just too much solder on the iron, but I've cleaned the tip and it's just really a matter of just working along this. Cleaning the tip each time. And it will eventually uh, get rid of the blob. A little bit more flux might help. So I think that's that side done as well. I'll do the other two sides, then we'll pull out the magnification and take a slightly closer look. Not too sure if this will work or not, but I've took the lens off my magnifying glasses to hopefully give you a bit of a closer look at the chip. And hopefully you can make out that uh, everything certainly appears to be soldered in place and there doesn't seem to be any bridges. The JED file needed to program this, you can just download it from the GitHub under the binary directory, and it's revision C is the one that we're using today. Liv2 has created an excellent little programming guide, and that's what we're going to be following. So my Raspberry Pi is already set up as described here. And all our cables are connected to the Pi as laid out here, with the only difference being we'll be powering the CPLD off the Pi's 3.3 volt power supply. So I've connected a wire for that to pin one. 
I've copied that JED file to the Pi. It's part up here, as you can see, and the wires are connected. With the only additional one, as I said, being the red wire from pin 1 here. That's providing 3.3 volt. So that is going to go in there like that. And then we'll jump on the PC and program it. Just connect to the Pi over SSH. Just browse into that directory. And let's run that command from the GitHub. I'm just going to hold this while we're doing the programming. Just to ensure there's a bit of tension on those pins going uh, onto the bluster itself. Just because we haven't soldered that in place. Any potential for loose connection there would uh, give us problems. But here we go. Ah. It's not buster.jed. It's bluster.jed. Third time lucky. Yeah, it was just me being stupid, wasn't it? So I originally downloaded that by just, you know, right click, save as, but that's not the actual file. That's not how you do it. You need to click here, raw. It's that one. You want to right click and save as. And so with the correct file, I copied over. Let's try that again. Yeah, that worked a bit better. One CPLD programmed. Just a bit more soldering to do on the back. So it seems that the voltage regulator isn't the only thing that I'm missing. I don't have the capacitors for locations C5 and C6. I'll have to order those as well. But we'll get 1, 2, 3 and 4 on. Capacitors C1 through 4. I'm just going to use a bit of blue tack like that to hold the uh, bluster here in place while we put those caps on. Just because we have the CPLD now on the other side, I don't want the board rocking. And I was able to clear those holes I had blocked. Didn't need to use the desoldering station. Just put a bit more solder onto them and then a bit of wick did the job. Well, I'm afraid that's about all we can do with this chip for now. We do have the legs to fit to it, but no point in putting them on until this stuff is done. They'll only get in the way. Still is quite a bit of soldering to do over on the motherboard though. So suppose we may as well just do that. We still need to fit the five Zorro slots. CPU slot, video slot and the three ISA slots. You would use these on this board only if you're using one of the IBM compatible bridge boards. Now the ISA slots themselves, they're the only ones here that are keyed. And I have to go on like that with the text on them facing into the board. So let's try and put them all on on the same orientation with the text facing in. I'm going to start with the CPU slot though. That is going to go in there. That is really tight. So I don't think I need to use any blue tack to hold that one in place. That is quite tight in there as it is. An awful lot of pins to solder. So you know what that means? Time for soldering montage.
all done, or at least I thought I was, because it wasn't until doing a bit of cleaning I noticed that the board has a bend in it. Just here at the Zaro slots. Not sure if you can make it out on camera or not, but there's a bit of a belly in the board just at that point. I'm not sure if that comes from the warp that this PCB had, or if I maybe did that when soldering the Zaro slots on. It seems to only affect the bottom two slots. And while it probably would be okay, there is a mounting point at this position here. So I think it would only be right that we now desolder those two slots, allow the board to flex up straight again, and then solder it all up again. I really didn't think I would have this thing out today. The bottom Zorro slot is out and the one above it is loose, but I can't get the warp out of the board. To be honest with you though, I don't think it's anything I done, because if we flip the board round and look at it this side, it's got exactly the same warp in it, at the same location. So it's almost as if the whole board has like a belly in it, just at this point here, running right through there. So I don't think there's going to be anything we can really do about it. It's maybe a little bit better, but I don't really want to force it, so I'll just put this back on, and I suppose it is what it is. Well, we're more or less back where we started about half an hour ago. Still is that bit of a bend in the board, but seemingly nothing I can really do about it. So let me just clean this up again, and then we'll maybe have a think about the keyboard. So, keyboard. This uses the standard Amiga 2000 keyboard connector. Five pin DIN. I just so happen to have one of those there. Granted, this used to be a seven pin, but um, I've cut the top two off, making it five pin. And that now fits in there. We do need something to type on though. And for that, we're going to use this keyboard out of an Amiga 500. So most of the signals that this keyboard needs are coming out of here. Working left to right on the existing cables from the 500's keyboard. We've got keyboard clock, keyboard data, keyboard reset, orange is 5 volts, yellow does nothing, that's just a key, green is ground, blue is status and purple is in use. On the Amiga 2000 side of things though, if we just pull up the schematics from the 2000 EATX, well, you can see that we're only going to be using four of those signals. Ground and 5 volt, of course. And then it's just keyboard data and keyboard clock. So I'm going to desolder this from the keyboard. We only need four cores, but I have a little five core wire here. It's not particularly long, but it will do fine for me. And we'll just connect this up to the appropriate pins at both ends. And that should be one working keyboard. So we'll use red and black for five volt and ground. Um, white we'll leave not connected. Green can do keyboard data. Yellow can do keyboard clock. So I'm going to bring the cable to that point there. You can put a cable tie around it there, the same way the original cable was. And then we need to make off yellow first. That goes into pin 1, that's clock. Green is data into pin 2. Red is 5 volts into pin 4. Uh, black is ground into position 6. White wasn't used. Everything's hooked up, so let's see if this works. Board still boots without any issues, so installing all our expansion slots, that didn't cause any problems. Right, let's see if this works. Keyboard test is F2. That worked. 
but while the keyboard may be working, there are some features of the keyboard that aren't. Firstly, and the most obvious one, is that the LEDs, well, they no longer do anything. And that's because the power to these, well, that was originally coming down the last two wires from the original Amiga 500 ribbon. And the other thing that's not working, that would be the reset. You can still press Control, Amiga and Amiga. You can see the caps lock key flashes almost as if the keyboard itself is being reset, but the Amiga, it's not. And again, that's because we lost the wire coming from here to an Amiga 500, the keyboard reset line. The Amiga 2000 doesn't actually use that signal. And equally, an Amiga 2000 keyboard, well, it doesn't have lights on it, so it doesn't have those signals coming out of its keyboard port. In fact, Gadget UK, he's done a really good video on these exact points from about a year ago. I will link it in the video's description. It goes into some detail about how the reset circuit from the keyboard actually works. So if you're interested to find that out, go check out his video. But for the purpose of this video now, all we really need to know is that Q1, transistor Q1, if we remove that, that should restore the reset function and to put some life back into these LEDs, well, we can just borrow five volts from somewhere over here via a 68 ohm resistor and that will bring those back. Now granted one of them is the power LED and let me think about this. It's the top one isn't it? The top one is the power LED. The bottom one is the floppy activity LED. We do have that spur white core don't we in our cable? The spur white core running down that and I suppose we do have one pin in here that is unused. I wonder could we pick up a signal somewhere on this board to restore the full functionality of that floppy access light. I'll have a think about that. I may have to pick the brains of some people on Discord. And when I say that, it probably will be Gadget UK's Discord. That's where I usually go to pick the brains of folk. And in fact, the whole concept for building these boards, the five of us that got together, that's where that whole idea came together. But let me have a think about the floppy access light while we pull out Q1 and run 5 volts over to the power LED. Okay, I have removed transistor Q1 from that position. And we have now installed a 68 ohm resistor from 5 volt reel, which comes in there, down here, there's a point there, so stuck the resistor onto that point and it's connected through to there. We follow that trace down here. It goes through a jumper on the other side, across there and into the top LED. That's the power LED. So before we do anything with the floppy one, let's flip this back over and test it. So let's see if we get a power LED and if the reset works. Red light. So power LED is working. What about reset? And yeah, that is working fine. Control Amiga Amiga. So what about that floppy signal? Is there anywhere on this board that we can pick that up, run it down that white core into this to make the other LED work as well? Well, I suppose the first question is, what is the signal that we're trying to pick up? I've pulled up the Amiga 500 Revision 6 schematics here. And if we just scroll down to where the keyboard connector is. Well, we know it's the last pin on the keyboard connector that relays the floppy signal. If we follow that back though, well, we can see that it's a signal MTR0. And I guess motor 0. The light only comes on when the motor spins. So let's see where we could pick that up on the 2000 EATX. Now I don't expect that this little circuit here 
will be present on our 2000 board but there's not very much to that we could build that on the bottom of the 2000 board and then just feed that signal out through that spur pin 3 and so just looking on the schematics for our 2000 it seems that we can pick up the signal we're after on the internal floppy connector on pin 16 now over here they are calling it MTR0D but I am pretty sure it is the same signal floppy header pin 16 if we go back to the Amiga 500 schematics internal floppy pin 16 MTR0 so we will run a wire from pin 16 over to pin 3 of the keyboard connector Remember that this board, when it's in the case, it will be sitting on standoffs. So there will be a little bit of space at the back of it. And what I think I'll do is just build that little circuit we seen. Just set it here on the back of the board. It is fairly straightforward. It's just a transistor and two resistors. We'll need to pick up 5 volt and ground as well. But I can just do that from the keyboard connector itself. So it might look a bit of a mess, but everything is hooked up as we need. We have motor zero signal here, picked up from pin 16, coming down this wire, running into both the 4.7K and the 10K resistor. The 10K goes down to VCC or five volt here. The 4.7K continues into the base of our transistor. We have five volt looped round here into the emitter of our transistor and then the collector that is connected directly to pin 3. The white wire is connected in there and then connected again here on the board into position 8 there. So let's just flip this over, connect everything up and see if the floppy LED lights up. So I'm just going to try this with sysinfo just because this takes a bit longer to load. Let me get test kit, sort of loads almost instantly off the disk but at least with this if this is working give us a better chance to see the LED coming on so disk is in the drive let's hit the button will it work oh yes yeah that is working perfectly Well, the other parts I need to finish off Bluster have arrived. The 3.3 volt regulator and two 10 UF caps. Bit of a problem though. My tweezers seem to have gone missing. They were sitting on my desk yesterday. But today they cannot be found. So I'll just have to use these things instead. But they work just fine. That's the only problem with these things though, they're just a wee bit too big at times when components are very close side by side. And in typical fashion I also ordered the wrong capacitors didn't I? Those are the bigger package. Now I do have them on there, I we'll had to put them on at a bit of an angle. I'm going to try and hit them with a bit of hot air to see if they'll pull in straight. I suppose while we're at it, let's just hit these ones as well. Last thing we need then is pins. This thing sits in the socket like that. CPLD to the top. But we need to put something through those holes to push it down into the socket. So, I've got these things. Now, I could maybe just put them through that like that. And then solder them on the underside. In fact, should I do that? I don't know, I'm of two minds. You see, the other thing I was thinking of doing, right, is to get something like that, another socket, put that on there, put that on there, just to hold everything. I could then put this on here, just protrude those pins through, just a little bit, sort of like that, and solder it all up and cut the legs off. I think I want to try doing it this way. So I'm pretty happy with the way that is sitting at the minute. I'm just going to concentrate on this outside row here. And I only want those pins protruding through this 
just a couple of millimeters at most. So let me see if I can get one of them stuck down. Then we'll try and get one at the other end. Yeah, that looks pretty straight. So let's do this one. Then try and do those two corners. Okay, I'm pretty happy with that. Let's just do all the rest of them. All done. And um, we've got good penetration of the solder through the board there, down to the other side of those legs. I'm just going to go along now and trim them all off. I'll cut them to, what, about 8 millimeters long, say, beyond where the solder is. That should be loads for going down into the socket. Well, I think that worked okay. They're not all exactly the same length, but I think they're close enough. Is that us finally finished soldering for this project? I think it might be. Let me clean this up a little bit, just to get all that flux off it. We'll put it into the board, and we should be able to test the Zorro. Okay, Buster is installed, or should I say, Bluster is installed. Before we put the Zorro card in, let's first of all just power on Make sure that this thing still works. Well, that's not good. So check this out. 3.3 volt CPLD. That's what the voltage regulator that we fitted, that's what that does. Brings the 5 volt down to the 3.3. But we can measure that at the JTAG header here. And if I do try to measure it, well, that is certainly not 3.3 volts. And it seems that's because I've done a bit of a dumb. We have a Rev B bluster here. And that voltage regulator I fitted, that's actually for the Rev C. Live2 changed the type of voltage regulator at the Rev C edition of the bluster to the more commonly available. LM1117, that's what I've fitted there. The type of voltage regulator that our Rev B bluster is expecting has a slightly different pinout, so we'll have to remove that and just manually wire it up instead. Just used hot air to remove our regulator, and yes, I found my tweezers. So this part we have is a 1117. But the part that we should have for the Rev B is a 1262. So I've pulled up the data sheets for both of those. The 1117 on the left here and the 1262 on the right. So you can see that for the voltage regulator we have, pin 1 is ground, pin 2 output, pin 3 input. Whereas the regulator our bluster is expecting is pin 1 input. Pin 2 is ground and pin 3 is output. The other thing just to note on this one, the tab at the back of it that's connected to ground, the tab on the back of this one that's connected to pin 2 which is the output. So we're not going to be able to connect that tab to this position here because on this revision board that is a ground. There's a ground pin there for example. Well, that was quite possibly one of the fiddliest things I have ever had to do, but it is done now. So, pin 1 of our AMS1117, that's ground. Now, rather than take it to that middle pad there, I just thought everything was a bit too close, so I took it over to that point instead. A little bit of heat shrink there, just to protect it, because a wire from pin 2 of this, which is the output, it runs down underneath onto that pad in there. Pin 3 of this, which is the input, that is connected, as I said, to position 1 on the PCB. So that should be it. In fact, going back to Gadget UK, when he was building his one, he had exactly the same problem that I've just had. So again, in his video, Chris goes into a lot more details than I've done here around the bluster. 
So if it's something you would be interested in seeing, I have left a link to that in the video description as well. But let's put our bluster back into the 2000 and see this time if it'll boot. Right, let's check our foldage first. So power on, and indeed 3.3 volts or thereabouts. Has the Amiga came up? I think it has because I can hear the disk drive clicking away there, but let's just have a quick look. And yes, it has booted. So you know what we have to do now? We have to test the Zorro slots. And for that, I have one Zorro card. AT bus clone. This will add an IDE port to our Amiga 2000 so that we can add a hard drive. For now though, that is going to be in the flavor of a one gigabyte SD card. I've just set this up with a copy of Workbench version 2.1. And hopefully, once we plug this in, it should boot. Now this CF card reader, that can be powered through the IDE header. And indeed on the AT bus clone, there is a little jumper here, which is currently enabled. That is for key power. And what that means is that the pin on your IDE header, which is usually keyed, there's normally one missing, but as you can see, they're all here. It's that one pin, which will carry five volts through to this, powering the SD card. So basically just means we don't have to power it separately here. On our card here, it is written front that way. So that will be the front of the case. Goes in there like that. Let's just try it in Zorro slot one to start with. Let's see if it boots. Oh yes, <laughs> works. Yes. Sorry, got a little excited there. Just want to test all five of the Zorro slots. I mean, I don't see why the rest of them wouldn't work if that one works, but let's just do that, should we? Number two works. As does number three. And slot four. And of course, slot five works too. Fantastic. Can't think of anything else that we need to do to this. Not for now, anyway. Well, other than, of course, put it all into a case. At the end of the last video, I asked the question, what type of case should we put our EATX 2000 into? My own feelings on the thing were that it should go into a case with a window so that I can admire my hard work here. But I asked your opinion on it and there were plenty of responses. Everything from it should go into a traditional Amiga style case, right up to it should go into a modern RGB gamer style case. I've decided to try and meet it somewhere in the middle. We are going with a modern case and we are going to put some lighting into it so that I can see my board through the window. But we're not going to go too over the top in terms of the RGB madness. The case I have decided to go with is the Deep Cool CK500. And one reason for picking this case is that it's one of the few modern cases that, first of all, doesn't cost an absolute fortune, but also supports an EATX board. But there is one glaring omission from the front of this case. There is nowhere to put any drives. Now this front section does lift off really easily. It's only held in place by magnets. But all that reveals is this filter and behind which are the fans. I do have a plan though for the front IO. And my hope is that this will restore at least floppy drives to us. Well, USB floppy drives in the form of GoTax. There are two USB ports here. And what I hope to do is pick up the cables from these internally. We'll run them to GoTax drives. And this one will become DF0 
this one will be df1. Now, at the minute, I only do have one spare GoTech, so I'm just going to try and hook up df0 for now, and we'll have to come back to what will be df1 at a later date. I do need to think of somewhere to put the buttons to select what disk image you're trying to load. And to be honest, I am still thinking about that. We've got a single power button, single reset button, and just the one audio jack. That won't be used at the minute, but my plan down the road is to add a headphone amplifier inside the case somewhere and make this a headphone jack. We can pick up audio from the back of the motherboard, that's handy enough done. But at the minute, that's just a line level. There's not much point in feeding it through to there yet. We would need some means of amplifying it. There is the one USB Type-C, which will probably just remain unused. Although, if I can find a way even just to get power to it, I suppose we could do that. And you could always plug in a cable to charge your phone from. There's not going to be a whole lot going on inside of the case for now, because we really just have the motherboard and the one Zorro card. Although, I do hope to get plenty more Zorro expansions in the near future. We do have a printed IO shield, which will go up in there. The two fans that are in here, those are going to come out. They're going to be replaced with these. And it is these fans that will give us the little bit of background light. In terms of hard drive, I did set up that CF card, but, and I know this is going to be controversial, I am going to use an old spinning Rust drive. This is a 4.6 gig IDE drive. It'll do for now. When I do finally get Kickstart 3.2.1 and its associated version of Workbench, I am going to replace this with an 80 gig drive that I have. It'll still be a mechanical IDE drive. And to be honest with you, that's just because I like to have that bit of noise inside the case. I find it a bit weird when a computer is totally silent. Well, it has been quite the journey, hasn't it? Our Amiga 2000 EATX is now built and it has a home in this deep cool case. And yes, before you tell me, I did hook up the wrong USB port, but when I get the second GoTech, make it DF1, I'll swap them over at that point. So what to do with this Amiga 2000? Well, there's plenty of expansion possibilities. All those Zorro slots are in there. Four of them still unused, so need to get more RAM into it. Want to build Live 2's Gotta Go Faster 2000 card. I need some way of getting software on and off the hard drive, so I'm thinking a network card would be nice to get some better graphics for the desktop. So how about an RTG card and to totally do away with that GBS scan doubler? How about a scan doubler to fit inside the case? Put it into the video slot. Now, of course, with all that in there, it's going to need a faster processor as well, isn't it? There is the coprocessor slot, so we could build an accelerator to go in there. It's probably going to be a terrible fire accelerator. And for now, anyway, probably the TF536. I understand Stephen Leary, aka Mr. Terrible Fire, he is working on an 040 accelerator for the Amiga 2000. So we'll be keeping a very close eye on that project, as I think 
this machine here would be absolutely perfect for it. But that is it for now. So please let me know what you think of the finished product. What would you have done any differently? And of course, if you enjoyed this video, I would appreciate a big thumbs up. Why not hit subscribe if you haven't done so already? There's still plenty more yet to come here on CRG, and I'll see you next time.